Hello and welcome. My name is Tenley Proudfoot and I'm one of the digital production assistants with Dataversity, stepping in for our chief digital manager, Shannon Kemp. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined by a special guest, Nigel, Tur Nigel Turner, to present data governance, combining data management with organizational change. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon on the very bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. Or if you would like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today, Nigel Turner and Donna Burbank. Nigel has worked in information management and related areas for over 20 years. This experience has embraced data governance, information strategy, data quality, data governance, master data management, and business intelligence. He is a great advocate for keeping information management as simple and business focused as possible and feels that a key role of information management professionals is to help business people relate to information management to real business ben benefits. And now let me introduce the speaker of this series, Donna Burbank, a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through, through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide um, in America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, and thanks for all who have joined. I've seen some familiar names, and I appreciate a lot of you folks do join every month, and that's, that's well appreciated. So <clears throat> if you're not familiar with our series, uh, the good news is that all of the past, um, the past webinars are on demand. Um, so you'll see that we've had some earlier um, in the year on data architecture and data strategy. Uh, we had a case study last month, which is one that both Nigel and I worked together on about data modeling at the Environment Agency of England. Um, and for those of you who don't know Nigel, he is my partner in crime at Global Data Strategy, and he runs the practice over in our European side of the pond. Um, and we are joining forces today to talk about what is near and dear, particularly to Nigel's heart, is uh, data governance. Not that I'm not a fan, but that's particularly Nigel's uh, <laughs> claim to fame. Um, and, and, and combining that, I think, uniquely with the focus on organizational change and how our data architecture can support that. So you've, you've seen the abstract track when you registered, but just to kind of talk again on today's topic, um, we're talking about data governance, obviously, but really the, the key, and I think uh, Tenley mentioned it in, when he introduced both Nigel and myself, is that one of our differentiators that we are passionate about is how you really make change in an organization, and, and more importantly, how you drive business value in an organization. And we've found, uh, particularly in modern times where so many companies want to be data-driven, it's governance that is really that vehicle that drives change and business value and, and really true strategy. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people do have sort of the old school at times uh, opinion that data governance is just, you know, management and telling people what to do and, and making sure your data is right, which is true. But really, when that is done right, that is what helps drive organizational change and business success. So that's really what we're going to start to talk about today. Um, and we'll align two things, org change and organizational structure and data governance um, and data architecture and how an architecture can really support that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over for Nigel um, to talk a little bit more about how we kind of see this data-driven business and data governance supporting it. Nigel? Okay, yeah, thanks, Donna, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where you're ringing in from. Um, I suppose it's one of, you know, when you pick up a, a, any sort of article these days on, on, on the business world, 
it's become a bit of a cliche to say that we're in an age of sort of the data-driven digital business. But because it's a cliche, it doesn't mean it's not true. And many organizations are trying to sort of move in this direction. Um, so clearly, you know, in this type of uh, new world that we're in, data is becoming increasingly more important. And I quite like the little Gartner summary on the left-hand side of this slide, where, you know, traditionally when people talked about business, they talked about the PPT triangle, people processing technology. And Gartner, I think, have quite rightly recognized that in the digital world where data now becomes a key currency of the business and a key data asset, a key asset of the business, that PPT in itself is not enough, that you need actively to manage data as well if you're going to use data to drive your business forward. And on the right hand side, I won't read through all of those because I think they're fairly obvious, but sometimes people need to be reminded that you know companies quite happily um, invest in and run human resources, HR departments to manage people and to support line managers. Everybody, pretty much every organization has some sort of an IT function. Many organizations have process uh, functions as well uh, because they recognize if you're going to improve the efficiency of processes, you need people to drive that forward. And I think data is becoming widely recognized now as being exactly the same as all of those. The data doesn't improve by itself. That if you are a company that relies heavily on data, and after all, what company doesn't these days, then you need to actively manage your data in order to improve it. And that's basically what I think the essence of data governance is all about. It's about the business and IT working together in order to develop that information asset. And um, if you talk about, you know, wh where does Dharma, for example, the Data Management Association, regard data governance these days? Well, it's one of the 11 data management disciplines. But if you notice, there's something a little bit different about data governance, um, which is that it's at, the, it's, at the, it's at the core, the hub, if you like, of the Dharma wheel of the 11 data management disciplines. And I think that's because what Dharma, what Dharma says, and again, something I strongly endorse, and I know Donna would, is that all the other data management disciplines, to some extent, depend on governance. And just to give you a couple of examples, if you take uh, something like um, data quality, for example, then which data you need to address, which data you need to improve, what sort of rules do you put around that data, can only really be decided by people in the business who are accountable and responsible for that data and manage that data on behalf of the business. And that's pretty much what governance is all about. So governance, I think, for any data-driven digital business is absolutely key. And I think with the way we look at, uh, at, at data management capabilities as well, and I'm sure if you've been on these um, webinar series with Donna before, you've seen this diagram a few times, then we also see, I think, data governance as being very much a bridge between what the business is trying to achieve, what its data needs are, and then, if you like, the more technical disciplines of data management that sit from level three to level five down, all of which must be part of the solution for most organizations in terms of delivering the data required by a data strategy to support the business strategy. And governance is very much about linking those two things together. So the people who are operating, <coughs> excuse me, in the data governance space um, need to understand the way the business is going, but at the same time have at least some understanding of those technical disciplines in order to recognize which of those things need to be developed to support data management. So governance for, for us is, is very much about, uh, about change and it's very much about improvement. And um, I've looked at lots of data governance definitions. You may have as well. If you, if you Google data governance, you'll see dozens and dozens of definitions. My criticism of many of them is that they're overcomplicated. And uh, as Tenley said earlier, I don't like overcomplicating things. And I think a lot of them as well focus far too much on this idea of data governance being somehow about control, about stopping people doing things with data that they shouldn't be doing. Now, I'm not saying that's not important, but I think that if you focus your data governance efforts pre predominantly on stopping things happening, that's the wrong emphasis for governance. And the definition that we use is the one you see here in the, uh, in the big blue box. And I think it's got sort of three key elements to it. The first is that, you know, it, it, because data in a digital business be, is increasingly an important business asset, it only makes sense for that asset to be owned by the business. Um, there are still many organizations out there that see data as IT's problem, and they're, they're becoming rarer, I think. But unfortunately, that, that culture, if you like, of, you know, when data's wrong, it's all IT's fault, is still prevalent. But it's the business that ultimately creates the data, and it's the business that, that, that consumes the data. 
and therefore the business must be at the vanguard if you like of any governance uh, uh, process and i think the other thing about governance is that it's a, a bau activity it's not a project with an end date although to start a data governance program if you're in an organization that doesn't have one then you need to treat that initiation phase if you like as a project with some deliverables and some time scale once that project comes to an end and at that point data governance is usual activity just HR, BAU function is working as the. The other thing I think I've stressed is that um, governance is all about demonstrating how the business can be made better through, through better data. And um, so the focus on any effective governance program has to be on improvement. And I think I've seen, again, another failing I've seen with, uh, with some governance initiatives is that it's all about monitoring data. So basically, you know, the governance team compiles a report of data quality, for example, once a month um, and tells the business, you know, our data is as bad this month as it was last month, and I'll send you another report next month which says it's as bad again. There's no point in doing that. There's no point in measuring something unless that's the basis of an improvement that you want to make. And so the implication of that as well, the other key word in that definition is benefit. So the, to, the benefits of data governance can't be intangible. Some of them might be, but if governance is really to work, it must be real and it must be measurable. And all the stakeholders of data, including the data creators, the data consumers, the people who, are, who amend and adapt the data, should recognize that it brings benefits to all of them, as well as benefits to the business as a whole. And that's what the way the ideal world should work. But but in our experience and also talking to many other data professionals, um, I think the, the norm in some organizations, at least, um, is that data governance is still a bit of a mystery to them. And they don't really see it as a core business capability. And therefore, when you know they come across, and I'm using bad data again as an example, but that's not the, prime, the only focus of data governance, but it very often is the key driver. If our data is not good enough to be a digital business, what do we need to do to improve it? And if you don't have formal governance and formal processes and formal structures for actually improving data, then you, we all know what tends to happen is that when data is bad, the, the reactions to that always tend to be reactive. Let's wait until we fit a problem. Then we'll put a team together and we'll do some panicking and we'll fix it. Um, it's often done in an ad hoc way so that everybody that comes across a data problem develops their own methods and their own ways of doing things, which can never be shared or reused anywhere else. Very often as well in those organizations, data cleanse and data improvement is a manual process. So they they, they download a load of, of data to a CSV file, you get it on a spreadsheet and eyeball it line by line. And I think the other problem is as well then that there's no real ownership of the problem. And I really like that quote that uh, Donna and I got from a senior client of ours uh, earlier this year. And it said, you know, we are told we're all responsible for data, but if everybody's responsible, then in reality, no one's responsible and nothing ever changes. So making key people take prime responsibility for data is vital and that's a key characteristic of any data governance program. So how do you make sure then that if you try and introduce data governance into an organization um, that you can actually make it successful and these are perhaps perhaps eight of the key lessons that, that uh, we've learned uh, during our time with clients and, uh, and engaging with many other people as well in the data industry. I think the first thing is that you know you need a clear vision of what good looks like in your organization. And if you're going to do a governance program, then basically, you know, it's again, I'm sorry to use a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Governance is a journey. You know, if you've got outstanding data problems that you've had for many, many years and people are fixing those problems in the ways I described, you have to take people on a new journey to a new destination. And you can only really do that if you have a clear view in your own mind as to what that destination would be like when you get there. Um, that's really important, I think, to paint that picture to excite people to want to get involved in any governance program that you're running. And the second thing as well, of course, is that but when you set out on that journey, you need to be realistic. So if you can only walk at the moment, then to say that we're going to get from here to Rio de Janeiro, I mean Wales at the moment, by the way, um, to get, we're going to get from Wales to Rio de Janeiro in the next six months is probably not likely, um, particularly if we're an organization which isn't very mature when it comes to data management and where sort of the, you know, the best practices of data management aren't yet in place. 
So when you set your vision, also be clear about what, what your expectations are. Then you need to align what you do with the benefits to the business, as in the definition I've just given. You could find bad data everywhere in your organization. You could spend time improving it. But that's unrealistic, and it's also unproductive. So what you need to do is identify which, which data you need to do something about and improve or enhance to benefit the business most and focus your efforts on that. And that implies as well, therefore, you need to be you need to prioritize the data that really matters to your organization. And again, that's why governance is essential, because it's only the business who can really do that. You can't leave that to IT, because very often IT don't really know which data is the most important. That should be driven by the business and not by IT. Um, the other thing, of course, as well that I see go wrong sometimes is uh, equip people to succeed. I, I'm a great fan of Game of Thrones, and uh, those of you who are fellow fans will know that the imminent battle with the White Walkers, the, the zombie soldiers of Westeros, is about to happen. And if you send a load of peasants out into the field unarmed, they're going to get massacred. And it's the same if you, if you, if you put a, a governance program in place and ask business people to step up to take the lead. You've got to equip them to succeed. And that means you've got to train them. They've got to be educated in the best practices. And they have to have the right tools and equipment to enable them to succeed. Also, you, you can learn from best practice. I mean, don't reinvent wheels when it comes to data governance, because thousands of organizations globally are now embracing data governance. And there's an awful lot of best practice out there. So learn from it rather than start from scratch. Something Donna I know will touch on later. Also, the other thing is that you can't get a governance solution out of a box, impose it on your organization and say, that's it, job done because every organization is unique. Every organization has a different journey, has different expectations, has a different priority when it comes to data, and therefore one size does not fit all in data governance. But you can use a framework in order to help you do that. And what I was gonna do later um, is come back and talk a little bit more about the sort of framework that we would recommend for governance. So what I'll do now is just hand back to you, Donna, to talk a little bit about how governance fits into architecture more generally. Sure. Yeah. So when you know Nigel mentions the framework, there, there's sort of several meanings to that word um, in the framework of that house. Really, is the architecture of the house. So there's sort of the governance framework that we'll talk about, and a key part of that for any framework is the core architecture, which you know is near and dear to my heart. So um, when I think of data architecture, I see that as just part, especially in the context of governance, as part of a wider enterprise architecture, because an enterprise architecture really starts to get to the people, the process, and how data is used in an organization. Um, and so we, when we ever do um, data governance, we often start with, I'll show some of the artifacts that you've seen in some of our other webinars, things like a motivation model, as, as Nigel just mentioned, getting to the root cause of the purpose and, the, and the, what the desired outcome is for governance is probably the most important thing you can do. You can sort of look at data quality, but what's the so what, as we say at the end? What are those business drivers? And then when you're, we'll talk a lot more about this as we go, trying to integrate governance into existing business process and your existing data governance, organi your existing business organization. Um, because you want to make this a business as usual activity, as Nigel mentioned, that this shouldn't be necessarily a separate thing. You have a finance department that manages money. It's not necessarily it's part of everyone's day jobs to make sure that your budget is, is aligned, right? So as is with data, it should just be part of everyone's daily oper you know, operations. And then, of course, the data and, and how you map the data to that, those processes. Um, so uh, if you've joined some of our previous webinars, you'll see that we often show this uh, just simplistic example of what we call a motivation model. And really, this is a way to, to get to the sort of touchy-feely part of things, right, the, the people side of things, but and, and if you're an architect on the call, in sort of an architected way. Um, and so that's one reason I like it, is it sort of make, helps make people make sense a bit, which can also be complicated. And I would find, having we've done both of, both of us on the call have done too many of these to want to count, often what makes a governance problem, project go wrong is it's not necessarily the technology, but the people and the different motivations and the different politics or the different misalignment. Um, again, generally not out of malice, but everyone has their own motivations. So getting that on the table soon um, and making that clear really helps align things. We've also had some very positive results. A, it's a simple one pager. You know, I'm a fan of that. Keep it simple. You know, building this could can take a lot of complex things and then sum it up. What are we trying to do with governance? We're trying to get better accountability, have better quality, and have a culture of data. Um, and it just makes that very clear. 
Also, and if you're doing data governance right, there will be some heated arguments because you're getting to the crux and it's that, it's that one sort of healthy place where people can argue about data go governance issues, right, or data governance. I was joking with a friend the number of times I've had someone literally raise their voice at me in the past four weeks about th their definition of customer was the right one. I <laughs> had to almost laugh because that happens at every organization until everybody gets in a room and battles it out a bit, um, that's where you see everyone else's perspective. So it's sort of like an in, in fighting within a family. When, when there's a good culture, that can work very, very well. But often when it does get heated, it's very um, helpful to come back to this one pager and say, "Why?" step back. I'm not arguing with you because I'm a bad person. I'm arguing with you because I'm trying to support our mission. One of the ones that really hit home with me, I'm working with a local hospital and they're trying to get a single view of um, provider in a master data management, a governed master data management effort. Um, and there was a debate of do we keep one of these elements, and a lot of people didn't know what that element was, and we're trying to keep it simple, and, and a lot of, the majority of the people got up and voted, let's get rid of it. And one gentleman stood up and said, no, this is the flag when we're trying to medevac a, a child who's on the brink of death to another hospital, this flag lets us admit them very quickly. And there's absolutely no way I'm going to take that off because someone's going to die. <laughs> that was maybe an extreme example, but we all got quiet. And that was such a very concrete way to realize, yeah, this sounds like it's a master data management. It'd be easier to drop a field. But there literally were lives at stake in this case. So in that case, it was very easy to point back to the mission and say, I'm arguing with you about this element because it has a business impact. And that's where I've seen, in a positive way, a lot of aha moments have come out of, of why that person in the other you know, department seems so annoying because they have a different destination of customer. Well, they're in marketing and you're in sales. And by definition, those are different customers. Or they're in HR and their customer is you, right? So it's a great time to listen and kind of get to those motivations. Another thing that is helpful, especially um, in, in, when you're trying to A, organize data, and then B, create a governance framework and a governance organization structure. So there's two sides to, to capabilities. One is your governance and capabilities and also the, the, or the uh, capabilities of the organization itself. Um, so this is a nice way to kind of, again, a one-pager uh, business capability model for the enterprise architects in the room. Um, of what are the core things we need to do? We're doing product development and marketing and sales and human resources. And then where, and this is just an overlay we often use, where is customer data used across? Or where is product data used across this? And, and, and one of the ultimate debates, and Nigel will talk more about this in the later, is um, you know how do you define stewardship? And one of the other, I've seen a few folks <laughs> jump in in the comments. Yes, the the, the age-old what is the customer definition? Which you know, if you wonder why people think, I joked about this with a client just the other day. You know, we wonder why they think the data a team is nerdy. Well, we just spent three hours arguing over what a product was, you know, or <laughs> what a customer was. But you know, this is critical. But often it seems very easy when we're creating stewardship to say, well, just create a single owner of customer and be done with it. How hard is that? It's one entity on the model. Well, that might be true from your modeling perspective, but not from a business where nobody owns customer, right? Um, that Or several people own customer, which is the more correct way to say it. If you look at the customer journey that we'll talk about, it, that customer touches a lot of people. Or in the medical uh, example that I gave, you know, does one person touch patient? You know, one person own patient in the organization? I hope not. I hope the person that checked me in in the admin office is just checking my insurance and not my you know, heart rate. I hope that's a nurse uh, that does that. And those are two different, very different departments, the admin and the, and the nursing department. So yes, two people own patient entity, and there's, there's different stewardship levels. So I think breaking down in terms of business capabilities and not data capabilities and not data domains, business. what is the business doing and how is data supporting that business can be super helpful. So um, I'll, I'll say it a lot, and Nigel will as well, is just keeping it simple. Um, one of my customers had a great quote that I will unabashedly steal. Uh, when in doubt, zoom out. And, and it's sort of when things get complex, that's where these high-level capability models, data models, process models, you know, motivation models come in handy. It's just zooming out before you can then zoom in. Before we do a detailed physical data model or a detailed master data implementation on customer, let's understand where data uh, customers used. Um, and that's often where we see things go wrong. We forgot a department, or we didn't understand how someone else saw this data, and that's where governance kicks in. And your governance organization should probably have or people from each part of these organizations that you've outlined. So that's sort of where the touch points lie. Um, there is lots of touch points with technical data architecture when we start thinking of data. Um, 
And I, I found this sort of a helpful way. This was something we had put together for an insurance company. Um, just trying to say that what are these tools, these data tools that can be super helpful uh, for governance? The data model um, is a very simple one. What are the, even the core entities we need to govern? Is it the brokers? Is it the claims? Is it the policies, customers, all of the above? And how do they fit together? Which then links with process. Where is data touched in this process? And again, that's another, and, and we'll talk about this later when you think of stewardship. Well, there's the claims department that touches the policy. There's also the underwriting department. You know, there's a lot of different departments that touch that same piece of information, and you need to govern along all of those processes. Um, a high-level data architecture diagram is another key aha moment that I often do is um, a data flow diagram as well might be in that, that whether it's just a high-level architecture and or often more helpful adding kind of the data flow. Of often data is, is incorrect because of the integration or things are missing. I think I've, I've said this in a webinar before, but I just loved it so much. We, we did a very short, it was an agile sprint for governance, the first implementation for a big retail company. And we had the head of marketing um, say, you know, I never thought I'd use the word data flow diagrams in a sentence, but I love them. I've never had someone explain why my campaigns didn't work. It's because the, the email campaign system was the campaign system wasn't linked to the master data hub, and so when people were updating their emails, it wasn't getting to the campaign. I mean, very obvious thing that no one had caught in that organization because no one had the time to zoom out. So again, that when in doubt, zoom out can really have um, some high-level impacts. And these, these are great things to share. Did this that retail company shared this in their first data? They had data governance sprints for the when we talk about organization. You can do that. <laughs> I've done that a lot. If the, if the company is agile, make governance agile. And we did sprints. We picked different uh, business pain points and did sprints with all of these architect all of these architecture diagrams. We had a business data model, process model, architecture, business rules, quality, all in a single one month sprint. Um, and actually, it wasn't a two sprint. Sprint. It was it was four weeks because these things do take a little bit longer, but they don't have to take a year. Um, so again, that was a nice way to really get to the crux of issues in a single way. Uh, business rules and policies, something, something as simple as a glossary, that's your classic, what do we mean by company, customer, what are the, the uh, policies around customer, is, are there insurance um, rules around what, how you can issue insurance policies, <laughs> um, are there HIPAA regulations for healthcare, et cetera. And then a data quality dashboard, and this I know is near and dear to Nigel's heart, um, is this is such an easy way, and he mentioned this earlier, of it's great to have a dashboard to say if, if we've prioritized that email is critical to our business for customers, how well is it even being populated, how accurate is it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's a great thing to monitor in each day of the governance meeting, so you can really keep track of how we're getting better. It's really is your dashboard for the organization. Um, so then you can start to kind of get, get to the crux of, of using the data for business advantage. Um, so I mentioned process, and I think there's a lot of, of alignment with business process and governance, um, because as, as Nigel mentioned earlier, you really want to make governance a business as usual um, activity, or BAU, and, and I always use the analysis, uh, the analogy of, of finance, right? And so the finance department is very much like the governance department or governance team, and you know, we often create words that can sound very academic to people like data stewards and data owners and data custodians. Well, when you think of it, you have the same your roles within finance. When I take a business trip and I have to put in my expense report and send it back, I'm a data custodian or a data steward, right? I'm stewarding the, the, the finance information that I manage. Just like a data steward is doing, is, that's just part of my day job is to take a business trip and fill my expenses. I don't think, oh, I'm doing finance governance I just am. That's just part of my job. And so many people across the organization, um, you know, often, and I know my, my um, colleague Bob Seiner uh, that often speaks to data diversity says this a lot as well, and I agree with him, of, you know, da data stewards aren't made, they're found. Of, of It's probably people that are doing this every day in the organization uh, that need to sort of be highlighted and promoted and given a voice to make change and, and make sure that what they're doing aligns with the bigger picture. So probably everyone on this call is a data steward or just data custodian or data owner in some sense, right? So that is was where these business process models come in, of in the different pro processes. You know, I'm doing supply chain accounting. Am I a data steward? You certainly are because you're, you're touching price and you're touching, you know, different... Uh, pieces of, of the organization. So that often helps. And I've used these when we train data stewards of saying, this is your day job, and this is where data, t this is the data you need to be responsible for as some of this, uh, some of your day job. Um, so uh, one of the tools I have been using more and more and more uh, to great success 
is in a way it's the modern version or the hipster version of the, uh, in my mind, of the process model is this idea of a customer journey map. Um, so anyone who is doing marketing or when we talk about becoming a digital organization um, often starts with a customer journey map. And this really is basically a process model or in a way. I know it's slightly different before anyone corrects me on the call. Uh, but from the customer's perspective, and this is another way like that uh, motivation model that I mentioned, is really to take – uh, people, uh, people's own personalities out of the, the equation and bring it back to the task at hand. So if anyone was at uh, the EDW, Enterprise Data World Conference in Boston, you might have heard um, our customer, Arizona State, uh, speak. And, and they built a student journey map, very similar, but it was from the student's perspective. And they, like any organization, um, had a lot of the competing priorities, and they had a lot of different teams looking at this. They did a data model and the customer journey map. And it was the app dev team doing mobile applications. It was the data warehousing team. It was the uh, the finance team, uh, the consumer services, all of these different groups, as you can imagine, with different priorities and, and different goals to try of their development. Um, and one, it was, he was the head of the mobile app development. said, you know, I had never seen data like this or my applications from the student's perspective. I never really thought of the impact of when we're sending out a campaign, how many times that student is touched each day with a web campaign or something like that. And so doing this from the customer journey is another great way, A, to understand how data can be governed across the journey, uh, how it can be better leveraged and used for business advantage, and it also helps break down any barriers across teams. Again, I'm not arguing with you, um, the fellow data owner, <laughs> about what a definition of customer is. I'm just talking about the definition of customer when they're at the discovery phase. And we, all we have is an IP address. So my primary key for you know customer right there is IP address. I don't even know their name. So you know it's a whole different type of customer, right? So um, these are a very helpful way uh, to basically, A, see where data is used, kind of understand how governance can kind of flow in the organization and kind of break down some of the barriers. So these are just a few of the many tools we use for architecture. Uh, there's many more in, in sort of different toolkits, but I hopefully that kind of gives you a sense of some of these maybe traditional or, or maybe outside your, your toolkit you're using that can really help prioritize, use, and make real to your organization what's going to make sure it makes sense to you and sort of implementing data governance. So that's one part of the framework. I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to talk about how some of these tools can tie into the other part of the framework, which is organization and people and process. So Nigel? Okay, thanks Donna. Yeah, um, basically I think earlier I mentioned that we think that adopting a framework is very important if you're going to embark on a data governance program. And this is the very high level version of the one that we use. It's sort of derived from industry best practice, but we've adopted to our own particular needs based on the sort of feedback and our experience of our clients and, and what they actually need. And again, in the attempt to keep it simple, we sort of say that in order to get data governance up and running, you need to think about six key core capabilities, if you like, that governance needs to embrace. And I think the point about this is that governance needs to be holistic. So if you focus too much on just getting some people in place to do something, you focus too much on the tools, you focus too much simply on the processes and workflows, you actually need to do all of this to a greater or lesser extent in order to make governance work. And um, it's, you know, we call it the governance house. And I mean, your business goals and objectives, Donna's already talked about, that really comes from the activities that are involved in producing the motivation model and the capability model that Donna talked about. The data issues and challenges, they, they also come from these things, but of course, predominantly, we would get those issues from the stakeholders that we talk to. And actually talking, identifying, and then talking to the key stakeholders in a governance program. And those stakeholders, by the way, should range all the way from pretty senior people in the company, ideally the CEO down, but you should also talk to some people on the ground, because I think we all know in many organizations, what actually happens at ground level isn't really always known to the people at the top. And um, we've had some quite interesting revelations from people who work with the data day to day who say, actually, no, it doesn't work like that. This is what we really do. So understanding, if you like, across the layers of the organization is really important. Once you've identified those two things, you can feed those into the roof of the house. This is a strange house because you sort of build it from the roof down rather than the foundations up. And then you can develop your sort of vision and strategy. And vision refers back to what I talked about earlier is you know, what would good look like? What do we want this governance program to deliver? What sort of tangible things will people see when we've done it that they, they don't see at the moment? And the strategy is really about, and how are we gonna get there? 
And I suppose the big decision that is often made when you embark on a governance program is, are we going to big bang this? So are we going to sort of do this everywhere? So we appoint leaders for whether they're data owners or data stewards across the business, and we get them to look at starting to improve the data based on the challenges and the issues that they've got. And that's certainly one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is you say, we've really got a big problem in one part of the business. Let's throw all our energy and all our resources into that. Pilot this, this our governance program there, prove that it works, learn the lessons, and then roll it out more widely to the rest of the organization. And again, both of those are very valid ways of implementing governance. It really depends on your organization. Um, well, I did this in a, in, in a company I used to work for. We piloted it simply because we came across a stakeholder that was unbelievably enthusiastic, gave us his full support, and really wanted something to happen quickly in his area. So it was looking a gift horse in the mouth if, uh, if we turned him down. So, and by doing that, we were able to build a very effective use case of the successes that we'd achieved and then use those to sell governance to the rest of the organization. So when you come across barriers, um, that is one good way of overcoming it. Find a friendly stakeholder, work with them, develop a use case, and then sell that use case to the rest of the business. So vision and strategy is all about that. Then, of course, you talk about, you know, what sort of organization do we need to put in place? Um, what sort of roles do we need to create? And what sort of skills will the people need who fill those roles? I talked earlier about not sending people naked into the battlefield. Um, then you've got to think about what processes and workflows do you need? So, for example, how do we know when data goes wrong? Uh, do we have a workflow to inform the relevant person that there's an issue and that they need to investigate and, and, and look at that issue? Then, of course, you need to think about the data itself, as Don has already mentioned. You know, what data is it that we want to manage through governance? Um, what are the KPIs that we want to set for that data? And how do we measure whether we're improving or not? And then culture and comms, I mean, Don has already said this anyway, a governance program crucially has to embrace everybody across the organization, but also sometimes people outside the organization. Um, you know, a couple of companies we've worked in, we've encouraged them to develop data SLAs with some of their suppliers because a lot of the data problems they were experiencing were because the data from their suppliers simply wasn't good enough and was involving a lot of work to fix it and to, and to try and clean, clean it up to make it fit for purpose. And then when you've thought about those things and what, sort of, and what sort of capabilities you need, you can then think about the tools and technology that you need to actually underpin those things. So what tools do you need for to manage issues, for example? Do you need to create an issues log? Do you need to create a data glossary? Do you need some data quality profiling and data quality re-engineering tools to help, you, to help you drive up the quality of data, et cetera, et cetera? So all those things are key things that you need to think about. But I think the key message is that if you just buy some tools, it's going to fail. You've got to have those other components in place first. And we, the reason we adopt this is we think there are lots of benefits of applying a framework like this. Um, Don has already, I think, hammered home the point that uh, you, know, you, could, you can use this then to align high priority business needs and the key data that you're looking at. I mentioned earlier that it needs to be holistic. And of course, as well, it sort of helps you if you use this to assess the, where the, an organization currently is. There may be parts of an organization when some of these components are already in place. And therefore, you simply say, you've got that already. Let's use that in perhaps a slightly different way, or let's use it as it is. And then in other parts, you might get some components are partly in place. So maybe, as I mentioned earlier, they do a data quality dashboard. The problem is they don't have people then to take the dashboard output and look at how data can be improved with, uh, to, to, to improve the score of some of the key data items within the dashboard. And then there'll be other areas where basically nothing is in place. And so you need a whole new work stream of activity in order to make things happen. A good example of that we came across, for example, could be training all the data inputters in better data practices so that they don't make basic elementary mistakes when they input the data. So if you do this, you've got your baseline, so you know where your journey is starting from. And it also then helps you to define your realistic targets that I talked about earlier and to say, this is where we are today. How realistically, how far can we get in three months, in six months, or in a year's time? And I think the advantage as well of the framework is that it's structured, yes, but it does therefore allow that difference that every organization is unique. And therefore, the, the, the emphasis and the focus you put on particular activities crucially depends upon the business drivers and the needs of that of particular organization. So how do you sort of come up with a framework? Well, we've got a, a whole series of questions uh, that we ask, and these are just a very small subset of questions. And I certainly would be pleased to know, don't intend to uh, 
identify uh, to read through all of those. You can read them for yourselves. Um, and you know, just a few key questions. If you, for example, you know, things like you know, vision and strategy. Um, you know, how does your organization rely on data today? And what is likely to change in the future? So if you've got a business, for instance, that's currently B2C, but they want to start selling B2B, do they have the data uh, of the businesses that they need to try and sell to? So that, that it helps to generate the right discussion, really. And also the key question there is what impact the data problems currently having on your organization? Then you talk about organization and people, you know, identifying who creates the data, who consumes it. And then asking the question, is anyone accountable or responsible for this data? Or is that scenario I mentioned earlier where everybody is and therefore nobody is? And then with processes and workflows, you know, are there ways of reporting data errors? Um, how do the business and IT work together to try and affect manage, uh, data improvement and to try and improve, uh, manage uh, data in, in that way? Then data management and measures, do you know what your key data is? Have you got data models, as Donna said, of the key data that can help you to identify the, the critical data? Culturally, then, um, you know, does the scene, do the senior managers of your company really understand what good data is and why it's important to them? Uh, and I mentioned earlier, it, are people being trained in it? And then tools and technology, is there a data architecture in place or is stuff just being created willy-nilly? Um, where is the data held physically? So you need to go into some detail in this before you can actually put the governance in place. But what I want to do now is because this, this, the, the main theme of this is about organization and organizational change, I'll focus a little bit more about the organization and people bit. And then what I've got here is simply an example organizational structure um, that could be applicable to a particular organization. And we use the word example there very, very carefully because this isn't not what we're saying needs, is needed in every organization. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But typically in many organizations, you see a governance structure that looks a bit like this. So you've got um, the involvement. I think the key point is that the, the, the executive leadership team or the board, whatever you call them, does need to be involved in this for it to work. It has to be driven from the top. And many of the successful governance programs I've seen is that there is an executive sponsor for your data governance program within the executive leadership team or within the board. And they are somebody, therefore, their job is to sell the benefits of governance to the rest of the ELT and make sure that the, uh, the, the drive for improvement comes from the top down. And then you need, in many organizations, depending on how big they are, some sort of steering group. And normally speaking, and again, in my experience, for any governance program to work, you need at least one person who is a lead of this whole activity that makes sure that everybody else is doing their job. And therefore, we'd always suggest, you know, you need a data governance lead. In a small organization, that lead could be part time. In anything bigger than that, you need at least one individual. And sometimes, depending on the scale and complexity of your program, more than one person who is full time to this. And then you've got your data owners. And I'll come back to how they are identified in a minute. And you also want to involve subject matter experts as well. So, for example, you know, when you're talking about customer data, the view of the data protection officer is clearly very important, the view of legal. It's very important as to what you can and cannot do with customer data. I can think of a few organizations that would benefit greatly from having those roles a little more carefully defined. But then also it's important, as I said earlier, that those people may, may steer the strategy and own the, the roadmap for data governance, but you actually need people at the ground level making a difference and, and making real change happen. And therefore, we, we, we're always an advocate if you create these working groups and the working groups often led by someone called a data steward whose day job it is to improve the data, working with other business data stakeholders, with, with IT people and with the relevant SMEs in order to improve or address a particular problem in the data area. Um, as I said before, this is just an example. Um, there are many other ways of organizing that as well. And here's a few sort of variances of that here, just to illustrate what we're saying that one size does not fit all. And the one on the left is actually from an, an organization I used to work in. This was an appropriate structure for governance simply because it was a very large organization with over 100,000 employees. Um, and it was a global organization. So there were sort of people responsible for data pretty much all over the world. So you needed basically to split it down in, in, into the three main business areas at the time, which are retail, wholesale, and global. Um, that you had an overall steering group, which consisted actually of an e of a executive leadership team member who chaired that, then a program board, 
led by a full-time data governance lead. And then you had business area boards as well that focused on subsets of the data problems within their own particular areas. But then the program board made sure that they were brought together and actually collaborated and cooperated where they needed to, where data, as Donna said earlier, was used across more than one function or part of the business. Then the second example, you've got a small organization uh, where if you notice, they were just basically you needed a steering group and one working group. And that one working group was probably sufficient in order to drive data improvement forward. And this was a company of around 400 employees, pretty much all based in one particular location in London. And therefore, your organization was much simpler and much flatter than the one for the large global telco. Um, if you take the third example, the consumer energy company, they had their, their whole driver for data governance was data quality. They had big issues with data quality, and therefore they had the steering group, but then the board that really did the work consisted of around 15 data stewards, each of whom had responsibility for key data entities and key data attributes, and their whole focus was on improving those, those 15 or those, actually 120 key data entities and attributes that were needed to improve core data quality within the organization. They knew wanted to become digital, but knew they had to fix these problems before they could even think about embarking on a digital journey. And then the last one, again, reflects a larger company where you needed basically two layers of data stewards. One who was a domain -like data steward, so that might be customer, for example, the lead data steward. And then sitting under that, you had subsidiary data stewards, one of whom is responsible for consumer, one for business, et cetera. So as you see, all those four models very different. Some of the same principles were the same, but the actual execution of those principles varies depending on the organization that you're looking at. So Donna, I know you wanted to talk a bit about federated governance as well. Yeah, I thought, and, and we actually had a healthy discussion between ourselves and just developing this of, you know, is it a level of maturity or is it just a different culture? And I think, um, uh, you know, some one comment was, um, you know, is, is federated the first step before you get to be more of a, you know, having a true steering committee? And I think it's just a difference in organizations. Some organizations are very federated. Um, some, that I mentioned before, are, are using Agile, and this whole idea of just mentioning the word steering committee is going to kill your project. That just will not fly, right? So this is a, a company we worked with, and they were particularly sensitive, and I, I found this very eye-opening for me, and, and I'll be using this going forward, being careful of this. They said everything you show is this very, t you, you say it's federated, but everything is a top-down. Everyone's Someone's reporting to everything else, and they were right. And they're like, our company's more concentric circle. <laughs> I mean, it sounded sort of a hip, it was not a hippy dippy it was a manufacturing company. So that one sort of surprised me, because I would have thought they would have been very top-down. And so for them, it was much more about collaboration um, and federation. So they were also undergoing a big digital transformation. And, and Nigel mentioned this before, but it's worth highlighting. We're also a fan of don't reinvent the wheel. I know this is a wheel, but a figurative wheel. Um, they already had a digital transformation team, and one could argue that digital is slightly different uh, from data, et cetera, et cetera. But this was at the executive level. And this is where sometimes uh, we data folks can argue ourselves to death in terms of, you know, and I, I think I chimed in in the chat. I, you know, I love the discussion of what is a train and things like that. We just need to not do that in front of people. Um, so we had that internal discussion of, well, I, I know that this is, you know, all the key executives. It was almost funny hearing us say all the key executives of the organization are making all the strategic decisions of the go-forward plan, but... I don't know, data isn't in the title. And one of us had to dope slap each other and say, guys, this is all the key executives. Well, just listen to yourself. It's all the key organizations making tech decisions. Isn't data tech? We're, we're supporting a digital transformation. So we sort of changed tech and, and just showed how data supports digital, which wasn't, you know, that's very much true. So the other part is that all of these teams were already doing data innovation whether it was marketing or supply chain, R&D, we wanted to respect that. And it wasn't that any reported to each other. It was more that if we had this council that got together, it was not a steering committee. It was a council of folks just sharing ideas. That was just going to align. And then the project teams that were developed, and I've used this at even non-agile organizations, you've got to move fast and show that quick win um, so that people understand what governance is, otherwise it's going to seem academic. So all of the teams got together, we realized we needed a customer MDM solution. Well, I don't, well, that wasn't necessarily a quick win, but they are doing it in small chunks, so they're picking a particular region, a particular subset of MDM. It didn't have to be a one-year effort. They're literally doing a couple-month sprint on enterprise-wide customer MDM, but they're all doing it in an aligned way. 
So this took us a long time to get up with, but it sort of respected the autonomy um, and it respected the culture. So I wanted to show this and the Agile Development Lifecycle. So I wanted to show this as just sort of a, because I do it myself, we tend to always use almost a classic DM Bach kind of steering committee working group. It doesn't have to be how it is, tie into the existing organization and culture. The other question, I've seen some of the chats about this too and in arguments back and forth, which is healthy and great, um, which is how you define stewards and how you define that definition of not just the councils but the stewardship. So I'm going to pass it back to Nigel and kind of some ways to look at this. Okay, thanks. So this is really all about how do you decide which people sit on whatever bodies that you create and whatever organization that you create, so what should those roles be? And I think what, uh, this is a slight simplification, but I think the way we look at the world, that there are five ways, basically, that you can have five different methods of appointing uh, people who are accountable for data to sort of governance type roles. And uh, basically, they fall into these five here. And you can read them for yourselves. So I'm conscious of time as well, so I, I'll, I'll work through this fairly quickly. Is that you can have a process centric model where the process owners become the data owners basically for the data created and deleted by the business process so for example if you are only procurement process in your organization and that process creates deletes and amends data then it makes perfect sense for you to become the data owner and the people within that that, that, that process to become the data stewards of the data that's one model and then a systems-centric um, model can also be applied. Uh, this was very applicable in my old organization when I worked for the telco I mentioned earlier, which is that there was a lot of business power and funding uh, were held by business people who were the, the owners of the key systems of the company. So there was a key, there was a key owner for things like CRM. Excuse me, my, that was my phone going off. Um, bad, bad practice. Yeah, um, and it was also Game of Thrones again. Yeah, so for example, if you had a business owner of the CRM system, then it made perfect sense for that business owner to become the data owner of the data held in the system. Then you're going to have a data domain approach, which is basically that um, you know you can have a person. Donna mentioned this earlier that is responsible for product, for example, right across the organization, cuts across the various processes and the various organizational boundaries. Then you can have an organization-centric model, which is basically you say, right, I'm in finance. We own finance data. The data owner of finance is a finance person, and the data stewards become finance people. Um, and that, that, that can work as well across geographical locations. So if you've got outposts in Singapore, Rio de Janeiro, and Montevideo, then you might appoint an individual in each of those locations to lead on governance efforts in those areas. And then finally, um, which is one we're seeing more and more, is what we call blended. So basically blended means a combination of all the above, um, depending on the particular part of the business that you're working with. So for example, in finance, it might make sense for it to be organization centric. If you're in the production area, then a process centric model or a system centric model might be more appropriate. Um, so how do you decide what's appropriate and what's not? And very quickly, what, I, what I've done here is just produce this summary of basically the pros and cons of each of the models. And I, this is, this is a, a wordy slide, and I apologize for that, but it may be useful reference for you. So are you trying to decide in your organization which of these models to adopt? Here, if you like, are a few advantages and drawbacks. And I think the key thing to stress here as well is that none of those models is perfect or the perfect solution. But one of those models is probably best for your organization, depending on your particular needs. So, for example, just a couple of very quick examples. Process-centric, that works really well where you've got a strong culture of process ownership in your company. If your processes are properly defined, you have clear owners for them, then putting data ownership there makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, system-centric works in the organization I just talked about where business people had a lot of finance, financial clout and a lot of influence because they were the owners of systems and therefore it made sense to align it with that. Data domain usually works better in smaller organizations it also used a lot in the insurance industry for some reason, but data domain centric is, you know, we'll work in a small company where maybe, you know, customer data might be used in three departments of that company, but it's not really that difficult for one person to take ownership right across that end to end data chain. And I mentioned already organization centric and blended. And basically, they all have pros and cons. None of them is perfect, and therefore, you pick the one that's best for you. And Donna, I know you wanted to talk then a little bit more as well about aligning things with corporate culture. 
Yeah, I think uh, this, these are just some things to think of. I think, you know, when I think of things that have gone well and gone wrong and when we've done, of course, never gone wrong with us, but, yes, we've all had we've all had it not as ideal as we wanted in the past. So much of it often comes down to culture. When I come into an organization, I try to be aware of that. I sort of watch how meetings are run. I kind of, you know, is it a top-down, is it federated? I ask people who are working there. And I think what can go wrong is, is just getting it uh, not the right fit, again, Agile or waterfall, one isn't better than the other. Just don't mix them in the wrong place. So, you know, think of your organization. Would it work better that it's more of a formal top-down that we get an executive steering committee that drives things? It could be due to your industry. It could, you know, I would hope a pharmaceutical company has a fairly rigid, you know, drug testing process, right? Which is probably very different from a startup um, doing some you know, web marketing, right? So, um, aligned to your your, your culture. Um, you, you know, do, uh, do people like meetings? Is that is there a meeting you always join on? Do people would rather get on a wiki or a Slack page? Um, or you know, the, again, think of that. Um, do people want to meet in person or not? Uh, fit fit what already exists in your customer. Don't read the DM block and say, oh, they talked about a steering committee, so that's what I'm going to have. That may be the way, um, but align that to your culture. Um, uh, we didn't talk as much as I would have liked. There's a whole other webinar on the idea of. When you're thinking of governance, um, is it offense or is it defense? Are you fisc uh, thinking more of aligning uh, to fix risk? Was there an audit breach? Are you a highly regulated industry and that's what management cares about? Or is it more about opportunity? And I'm going to kind of start to pre-answer one of the questions was how do you get the buy-in of your executives? I would say, number one, think of that first. Don't go to a, an executive board that's all about their grand new product launch and an opportunity and growth and say, you know, it's not going to work, your data's bad. That's, that's going to be the wrong thing. Similarly, um, don't go to a very heavily you know, regulated industry and talk all about just uh, the only data opportunity. I think us on the call as data people tend to go more towards the risk and maybe want to be a little more positive on opportunity of how good data could help, right? Also, pace and timing. Um, I always look for a quick win uh, in an organization, and I always ask, what's quick for you, all right? So some quick wins are two weeks, some are two months, some are two years. I, I would disagree with two years, right? But what's fast in your organization? Uh, Nigel and I mentioned on the third bullet, complement what already exists. If there's steering committees uh, that you could align with, as long as you don't lose the data focus, all power to it. Are there data owners and stewards that could be promoted? And, and look at it as a, a promotion to data owner. Work with what works, right? That's kind of a, a whatever funny term, but that's your, going to be your easier path to success, align with existing processes. The last one, and, and we already talked about semantics, uh, language matters. If, if people get hung up on meeting minutes because it sounds too formal, call it an action log. If it's not a steering committee, it could be a council. I had one customer that called it a tribe, right, a collaborative, whatever it is. Uh, but get that right, or you could get one company, instead of a steering committee, it was a data strategy council, and they had people signing up to join that. So give, give that some thought. Um, I know we're close on time, so these are just some use cases you can read in your ledger um, on sort of what has worked and what their drivers and priorities are. Um, and then we probably only have a time for a question or two, um, but while Tenley is uh, kind of um, coordinating those, I'll just kind of point to next month if you're interested in Master Data, please join us again. Tenley, over to you. Great. Um, we actually do have some questions. Um, the first is regarding finding data stewards. How do you engage a department where you know who the stewards should be, but the powers that be will not allow the time for them to govern, or for them for to governance? Yeah. Sorry, I'm struggling with that uh, one. I'll say two <laughs> quick things, then I'll pass it over to Nigel. I think one is that I've had this question a couple times in the past few weeks, just, just documenting how much time is, and I think we often forget that. This person should be spending 10% of their time, and they will be doing this. Sometimes we're a little too vague or we expect people to know. And the other thing is tying it into something that's already helping. Hey, they're helping fix the data for that marketing campaign. Could they just spend an extra 10 uh, whatever? And then often those two things, the why and the very clear on how much, can sometimes help. But what do you think, Nigel? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it goes back to something I said earlier as well about the importance of getting support for your governance initiative from the very top of the organization. I came across this when I did this in the telco I worked in. And the way we broke, we broke the barriers in two ways. Uh, the first way of doing it was simply we got more senior managers to say, tough, get on with it. This is an important business priority and therefore it's in your objectives to improve your data. And therefore, you need to appoint data stewards to make sure that happens for you. I think that's really important. The other thing I would say as well is something I touched on earlier. When you get that resistance, 
don't um, then then walk away from that department. Go to another department where there is more enthusiasm and people are prepared to allocate time. Prove the benefits and then go back and see those people again and tell them what they're missing out on because they haven't found you know they, they haven't got the will or the time to do that. In other words, provide them with real hard evidence, empirical evidence that data governance does improve a business and kind of help them improve their own bit of the business. Okay, well. Thank you, Nigel and Donna, for this great presentation and Q&A, but I am afraid that this is all the time we have for t here today. Um, just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and I will be sending out a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information. Thank you again for attending today's webinar, and I really hope that you ha everyone has a great day. Thanks, all. Thank you.